Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Idahoan Show. Today I want to talk about and give you a demonstration of the process of flame bluing. Uh, hopefully this will be the first in a series of videos on different methods of bluing steel, uh, which I'd like to do because I'm afraid that there's a lot of misinformation floating around on the internet about bluing and the various methods of bluing steel. So I'm hoping to set the record straight and perhaps more importantly give you a more comprehensive perspective on the variety of bluing methods that are out there uh, and how you can implement them yourself in your garage if you so desire. Now to begin with, what is bluing? Well, iron or steel can form two different types of oxide. Uh, first, there is rust, which we're all probably familiar with. Uh, it is typically a brown or sort of red-orange color. It's often kind of a powdery layer on the surface, and it provides absolutely no protection for the steel. Uh, you know, as something is rusting, it continues to rust as long as we let it. Uh, and if it proceeds far enough, you often get pitting and other defects that are detrimental to the metal object in question. Then there's what's sometimes called the delta phase oxide of iron, which is typically a black or bluish gray color and forms a much more adherent, cohesive layer on the surface of the metal, such that it provides some degree of passivation, uh, which simply means that additional oxygen from the atmosphere can't get through the existing oxide layer to react with the metal underneath, and so once an oxide layer has formed, the oxidation kind of comes to a halt. It, it doesn't continue to corrode. Now, even the black delta phase of iron oxide is not nearly as impervious to penetration by oxygen molecules as something like aluminum oxide or titanium oxide. So even in its blued condition, steel is not nearly as corrosion resistant due to passivation as something like aluminum or titanium. But it's better than nothing. And so bluing has traditionally been used as a way of protecting steel components, as well as for aesthetic finishing of steel to give it a blue or black appearance. Now, how do we go about actually growing a black delta phase oxide layer on a steel component? Well, as I said, there's a bunch of different methods which I'll hopefully cover in several different videos, but today I want to talk specifically about flame bluing, uh, which grows the oxide layer simply by heating the steel component to about 900 degrees in atmospheric oxygen. And at these elevated temperatures, atmospheric oxygen will react with the steel to form this adherent black oxide layer. Now, uh, this could be done in a furnace of some kind, or it can be done just over an open flame, such as a propane burner, uh, which is what I'm going to demonstrate here in just a minute. Again, flame bluing is probably the process that I use the most because it's really simple to set up. All you need is a, a torch or a propane burner and the metal that you want to blue and atmospheric oxygen. You know, there's no special chemicals required, no special setups. Uh, it's just really easy to implement and in my experience it can give very good results. So here I have a steel component that I want to flame blue. Uh, this is mostly low carbon steel. Flame bluing and most other bluing methods for that matter uh, will work well on carbon and alloy steels. Uh, but give mixed results on stainless steels depending on the particular stainless alloy. Then again, you don't really need to blue stainless steels because they are stainless. You know, they're already more corrosion resistant than what a blued carbon or alloy steel would be. Now, about the only surface preparation that I've done to this component was to clean it up with a wire brush. Obviously, I don't want to have bulk surface contaminants on here like 
you know, paint chips or, uh, you know, blobs of grease or massive amounts of oil or machining fluid, uh, because those would introduce non-uniformities in the bluing that I get. But flame blowing is pretty forgiving of having like, you know, a little surface sheen of oil or something because it'll just burn off and won't really affect the uniformity of the bluing job that much. So without further ado, let's go blue this thing. I'm basically just going to hold it in the propane flame until it starts to discolor. Uh, you know, keep the flame moving a little bit just to uh, keep the application of heat more uniform. And, you know, as, as it starts to discolor, we'll see kind of a, a rainbow effect of, you know, different shades of bluing, starting with kind of a, a straw color going through sort of, you know, some purples and blues and a, a real deep black, and then finally ending on sort of a, a gunmetal gray. And in this case, and in most cases, I should say, uh, I blew things all the way to that gunmetal gray color, uh, which gives me the most uniform coating in most cases. You can try to stop the process uh, earlier, and in which case, if you have really fine, you know, precise control of your heating, you can get any color you want. If you don't have real precise control, as you won't if you're just using a flame like I am, uh, then it's hard to get a real uniform color other than gunmetal gray. Uh, but you can get kind of a rainbow you know, effect reminiscent of color case hardening. So I might actually try that on another one of these uh, as well. Okay, this has now cooled to room temperature. Now, as I said, the flame bluing process burned off any oil that may have been on here, and blued steel is really only partially passivated, so it's good to keep it oiled. Uh, so the next thing I'm gonna do is wet it down with a rust preventative oil. Oiling the flame blued surface has the added aesthetic benefit of making it look darker and shinier. So, as you can hopefully see there, uh, that gave us a nice uniform black or sort of dark gunmetal gray bluing job all over this metal component. In fact, uh, even this one that I was trying to do non-uniformly to get kind of that rainbow color case hardening effect uh, actually came out more uniform than I intended. Uh, you can see a little bit of the, the color variation in it, but really not a whole lot. So, if anything, uh, that just goes to show how easy it is to get a uniform uh, gunmetal gray coat when you're doing flame bluing. So, as I've been saying, flame bluing is kind of my go-to bluing process because it's simple, it's not a finicky process, it's easy to get good results, doesn't require any special chemicals or special setup, so on and so forth. Uh, but it does have its limitations. For one thing, it requires very high temperatures, typically 600 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, Maybe a little bit less if you're going for kind of the rainbow color case hardening appearance, but uh, in any case, the temperatures that are required are potentially high enough to alter the heat treatment of heat treated components. Now, that's not always necessarily a problem. In this case, where I've got a component that's made of low-carbon steel, which is relatively insensitive to heat treatment, 
the flame blueing process doesn't change its mechanical properties enough to make any difference in terms of its strength or functionality. In other cases, you may actually be able to integrate the flame blueing into your heat treatment process. For example, uh, sometimes I've made components out of 4140 alloy steel, typically uh, machine the component in the annealed state, then austenize it, quench it, uh, and then polish the component and use the flame blueing as the tempering phase of the heat treatment. So when all is said and done, I have a nicely blued, quenched and tempered alloy steel component. But depending on the specific heat treatment that you require for a given component, that may or may not be a viable option. And that brings me to what I see as the second major practical limitation of the flame blueing process, namely that when you have a component with relatively small features or protrusions, maybe something like this punch that steps down from a relatively large diameter to a very small diameter, it's very difficult to heat the main body of the component enough to get a good bluing without overheating these smaller protrusions. Now again, if the component in question is relatively insensitive to heat treatment, then that's not too much of an issue. You, know, you can heat up the main body as you need to, and if the fine features uh, momentarily get heated to 1500 degrees where they're glowing bright orange, uh, when they cool down they'll still have a nice gunmetal gray oxide layer on them. Uh, but if you have a component that is sensitive to heat treatment, then obviously that's going to destroy the temper of those fine features. But for components that require a very specific heat treatment, especially if they have fine features that uh, may be challenging to prevent them from overheating, uh, there are other bluing methods that may be more appropriate, and uh, Lord willing we will discuss those in future episodes. Now one final thing before we close, I'd like to clarify that flame bluing is not the same as hot bluing. Uh, there's at least one popular video on the internet that presents basically the flame bluing process and refers to it as hot bluing, which is a complete misnomer. Uh, hot bluing is a process that takes place typically between about 200 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to burn your fingers, but not hot enough to change the heat treatment of steel components. And in order to do that, you have to use a chemical catalyst, which we'll hopefully talk about in a separate episode. For now, just bear in mind that contrary to what you may have heard elsewhere on the internet, uh, the process I've shown you here today is flame bluing, and hot bluing is something completely different. But anyway, until then, thank you for watching The Idahoan Show.